Let's have a look at one of these sanatoria, or tuberculosis hospitals as they are called today. Real hospitals for the tuberculous, and not merely resting places. Here we are in a large southern sanatorium. This one has beds for 500 patients. Altogether, there are now 90,000 such beds available. Rest and more rest, as Trudeau discovered when he himself took the cure as a young doctor. Yes, and good food. Nowadays, doctors don't stuff patients with more milk and eggs than they can digest. Just good, well-balanced meals, enough to gain weight on. Mmm, smell those delicious loaves. New ways of resting the lung have been developed. This patient is getting pneumothorax treatment. Air is let into the chest cavity, and that rests the lung so that it can heal. When the diseased lung is fully healed, it is allowed to expand again. A lifesaver for many. Each patient is helped to find his place in the workaday world when he leaves the sanatorium. Here's a class in typewriting. In this sanatorium, as in many others, children of tuberculous parents who cannot be properly protected otherwise are cared for in the special department of the sanatorium. Waverley Hills, a name now infamous among paranormal researchers, enthusiasts, and more than likely even casual onlookers alike. Waverley was a tuberculosis sanatorium built on the outskirts of Louisville in the early 20th century as a coping mechanism to an epidemic that was tearing through the United States and the state of Kentucky. In modern times, it's fallen to ruin, but found a new form of fame by taking a seat as allegedly being one of the most haunted locations in America. But does the history match up with the hype of the endless cable TV specials and spin-off B-movie horrors influenced by the skeletal ruin? Today, we dig into the history of the sanatorium, and discover at least some of the realities of Waverley Hills. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Hello and welcome to Dark Histories, I'm Ben, this is Season 3, Episode 7 I believe, and today we're going to be looking at Waverley Hills, which has been a massively requested episode since pretty much day one of the podcast, and I pretty much always put it off because... My knowledge of Waverley was always basically bad ghost hunting shows. And so I was sort of not really into it. I, I was, because I used to watch a lot of those, well, I still do watch a lot of those bad ghost hunting shows. But it, it, it felt like I, I couldn't offer anything or bring anything different or, you know, from a dark histories kind of angle. But I've, I've sort of sat down and had to think about how I could do it and make it work. And I finally feel like I've achieved that. Um, so yeah, today we're going to be doing Waverley Hills. Before we start, as always, I just want to give a thank you to all of the patrons and the new patrons who in no small part go a long way to make this show doable. You know, so thanks for giving the opportunity to keep making the show for everyone. So we've got new patrons, we've got Jess, we've got Hayley, we've got Susie and another Susie. We've got Thomas, Amy, Lauren, Virginia, Brad, Jason, Susan, so almost to Susie. So thanks very much to all of you new patrons. Welcome aboard. Thank you so much for your support. It's really kind. Also got a donation on coffee this week from Corellia. So thank you very much, Corellia. That's pretty much covered one of my historical newspaper subscriptions for the month. So thanks very much. Okay, let's get this story started. This is Waverley Hills, The History and the Haunting. Responsible for over 1.6 million deaths in 2017 alone, it has infected billions over its 70,000 year life, killing ancient Egyptian kings, described in the Bible and written of profusely by ancient Greeks and Romans. Known as Thysis, the White Plague and Consumption, so named for the disease's propensity to consume the victim, causing huge weight loss. Tuberculosis has killed more than any other infectious disease and more than HIV, influenza, Black Death and the bubonic plague combined. Historically, victims had less than a 50% survival rate 
and many household names, including Lord Byron, George Orwell, Paul Gorgon, Frederick Chopin and Eleanor Roosevelt have all fallen victim. Savagely infectious, one in three persons coming into contact with a sufferer were likely to contract the disease themselves. In the early 19th through to the mid-20th century, tuberculosis was a common killer in the United States and Kentucky routinely led the charts for the disease's high death rate. It launched into its epidemic state during the Industrial Revolution with the vast emigration and movement of people who grouped tightly together in new cities, all with the poor understanding of infectious diseases. Several generations of one family might huddle in under one roof, making conditions in these industrial cities cramped, which, coupled with their lack of proper sanitation, became a menagerie of disease. Tuberculosis was a slow, steady killer, eating away at a victim over a prolonged period. Symptoms were not always easy to spot at first, with a general feeling of being under the weather a poor descriptor for catching a disease in its early life. It would develop, over time, into a cough, low-grade fever and weight loss. Chest pains, throat ulcers, coughing up blood and pale skin would follow, eventually leading to the victim's infected tissue dissolving as the disease slowly ate away holes in the lungs a common form of tuberculosis, making it difficult to breathe or talk. The doctors named it the graveyard coughs. For those 50% that were lucky enough to survive, relapse after a brief remission was commonplace. One of the most common and well-known symptoms of tuberculosis is coughing up blood after the disease infected the lungs, but it was also possible for it to affect the central nervous system and brain sending the sufferer into a state of poor mental stability and straight off to the insane asylums with all their 19th century creature comforts. In Victorian Britain, it was responsible for one in four deaths, and in the United States, it's estimated to be closer to one in two deaths. Though with no adequate way of recording deaths available at the time, some have estimated it as high as 80%. It spread through the population as quickly as it would spread through the body of the sufferer, leaving behind little but decay. Amazingly, given this description, it was for a time considered quite fashionable to have the disease. It was thought by many that due to the high number of artists, musicians and writers who had the disease, that it played a role in artistic talent. Victorian-era women would aspire to a form of bizarre, consumptive chic, with thin waists and pale skin caused by the disease's propensity to cause weight loss in its victims, as their appetite was steadily diminished. The constant low-grade fevers it caused would redden the cheeks and lips, and with attitudes not so entirely different to today, these were all traits which were pushed onto women as attractive to emulate. Tight-fitting corsets launched into fashion, along with the widespread use of makeup to whiten the skin and rouge the cheeks. Darkly, handkerchiefs were carried. The sufferers of tuberculosis would cough blood into them, whilst the fashionistas simply folded them neatly into their pockets. As understanding of the disease, and the way in which transmitted diseases were carried generally, many of the fashions changed to accommodate, and by the 1880s, as strides were made in this understanding, long skirts became seen as a neat way to collect filth and disease from the street, and in men too, beards, which were so common in the first half of the 19th century, came to be seen as a safe haven for noxious germs. Before this time, bad smells, bad spirits, open sewers, hereditary traits, rich diet or lazy attitudes were all at one time or other blamed for the spread of tuberculosis. The discovery of airborne transmission may have been a breakthrough, but it had an effect on more than just the fashions of the day. Public health warnings were issued and laws written up that commanded tuberculosis sufferers to report their condition to local health officials, with their names being made public knowledge. Landlords refused to rent to the victims and beauty parlours, barber shops and house bars refused to serve them on the grounds that they were too infectious. This, in turn, led only to a sharp about-face in public flaunting of the disease and rather than the icon of high fashion it once was, it now made the disease a dark secret, leading to sufferers holding back the truth about their infection 
until it was far too late for doctors to do anything about it to help them. In truth, even if the sufferer did admit to the disease, doctors could do little to aid them. The most common treatment was rest, relaxation and fresh air, away from the pollution of the cities. Sanatoriums built in the hills and mountains on the outskirts of towns sprung up in the late 19th century to house victims and played the role of both giving them a quiet location to rest and relax and as a way to quarantine the disease away from the cramped cities which only fostered the spread. In America, Massachusetts was the first state to build a state-funded sanatorium, originally called Massachusetts Hospital for Consumptive and Tubercular Patients, and later Rutland Heights State Hospital, which opened in 1895. Built among the hills and woods of Rutland, it was no coincidence that it stood overlooking the valley below. Since the 1840s, experiments in using fresh air as a treatment for illness had been commonplace, from the casual suggestions of seaside breaks to seeking more extreme sources of clean air, such as the treatment proposed by Louisville physician Dr John Krogan, who opened up a cave on his property to a select group of tuberculosis sufferers offering them the chance to live underground full-time for one year. Krogan was convinced that the pure air would work as a cure. He made accommodations for a 100 patients to live sufficiently in the cave system, with dormitories, doctor's office and his own dwelling by the entrance. But in September 1842, when the project opened, only 10 sufferers had signed up. Krogan forged on regardless. However, he had not foreseen the challenges of living underground, and the boarders found their dormitory stoves not equipped with any exhaust, bilging out smoke that suffocated the dwellings. Mould and mildew was a constant problem due to the high humidity, and eventually the project was forced to close prematurely after just five months, in which time three of the ten patients had died. Dr Charles Wright, another Louisville physician, said of the patients after a visit to the caves. Those patients who remained in the cave presented a frightening appearance. The face was entirely bloodless, eyes sunken and pupils dilated to such a degree that the iris ceased to be visible so that no matter what the original colour of the eye might have been, it soon appeared black. After the project was abandoned, the longest patient to survive was Oliver Azard Perry Anderson, who died in 1845, far outliving the other nine. Krogan recognised his failure, but still held out hope for his pure cave air until his own death from tuberculosis in 1849. Still, Krogan had been an early adopter of a trend that continued, and sanatoriums sprung up throughout the US, built in locations thought to be conducive to exposing the patients to the freshest air possible. By the turn of the century, Colorado and Kentucky had the highest tuberculosis death rates in the whole country, with one in eight deaths in Louisville attributed to the disease. The Hazelwood Sanatorium opened in 1907 with a startlingly deficient 16 beds for tuberculosis patients. The Downtown Louisville Outreach Program, the Tuberculosis Dispensary at 121 West Chestnut Street, ran entirely by volunteer physicians, had seven nurses on its roster, servicing 400 patients. Louisville was in dire need of a bigger facility. Ten miles from the centre of Louisville, 300 feet above the Ohio River, lay a large patch of farmland. It was remote, with the only operating buildings being a small dairy and Chesterfield train station. The land had been bought by a man named Major Hayes, who had built a small one-room school for his daughter. The teacher, Miss Lizzie Lee Harris, named the school Waverly Hill after a series of books written by Sir Walter Scott. Now, in 1908, with the death rate peaking in Kentucky, the state bought the land using money raised from bonds and a statewide property tax. They built the original sanatorium at a cost of $150,000, and ran it on a cooperative basis, with all large cities of Kentucky putting forth members who sat on the board. It was a large, two-storey wooden structure, designed by local architect James J. Gaffney, and also consisted of an admin building and two buildings which would house the sick, 
one for those thought curable, and one for those less fortunate. The whole campus sat on 174 acres of land. They retained the name of the school built by Major Hayes, and Waverly Hills Sanatorium formally opened two years after its inception and after a brief delay to its original opening ceremony date on 12th of October 1910. In a speech given on the opening day by L.J. Dittmar, president of the sanatorium, he spoke of the institution's future plans. This is, as you see, but the beginning of a tuberculosis hospital. Our needs are still many, and the extension of this plant is limited only by the amount of money placed at the disposal of the board to carry on this work. And work certainly needed carrying on. Dr. A.M. Forster was employed as the medical director, and the first thing he wrote off on was the addition of eight new beds, pushing the capacity up to 48. All tuberculosis patients in the local area were promptly moved to the new sanatorium at a further cost of $25,000. However, it soon found itself at capacity, and then some. Many of the original patients spent their first year at Waverley camped in canvas tents on the small campus grounds until adequate space could be made for them in December of 1912. During that first year, life at Waverley was rough, and it continued in a similar manner for the first ten operating years of its life. A.H. Bowman, president of the Jefferson County Board of Tuberculosis Hospitals, said of Waverley, There is not room to isolate patients, and in fact, the building is so crowded that we have no place for patients to die. Patients are crowded together in an insanitary, inhuman manner because of the lack of room. After much politicking in the local community, expansion was greenlit and the space for a further 435 patients was made with large building projects funded by the taxpayers and in local bonds at a cost of $750,000 to Louisville residents and $300,000 to Jefferson County. By 1923, a further 200 staff, 80 acres of land, and another 100 beds had been added to the by now sprawling campus that offered stays at the hospital free for long-term residents of those cities whose residents had contributed to its building and expansion. The largest building was finished in 1926, standing five stories high, boasting fire-resistant fittings, which was a new concept at the time, a cinema, kitchen, solarium, several laundries, a dentist, library and bakery. Each bed had its own telephone, electric light and bell signal. It also boasted modern treatment rooms and surgeries. It now also, finally, had space for the treatment of the black community. Given that tuberculosis was such a readily spread disease, nurses and physicians were employed who had already had in the past or even were current sufferers of tuberculosis themselves. The staff lived on the campus grounds, meaning that many were either endangering themselves or, in the very least, placing themselves in the direct firing line of the disease in order to help others, a fact that is often overlooked in modern-day retrospectives on large tuberculosis institutions. Treatment at Waverley was varied, though the bulk was simple rest and relaxation. This would go further than you might think for rest, however, with patients being denied almost every form of entertainment with nothing to do but lay in bed and sleep. This stretched to books and even food, which would be scaled down to only those that were deemed bland and boring enough as to not overexcite a patient. That said, nutrition played a big role in the treatment at Waverley, with patients being fed three meals per day despite suffering from severe lack of appetite brought on through the tuberculosis. Fresh air was seen as one of the other predominant forms of treatment, and many areas of the hospital were built with large window frames containing only mesh rather than panes to allow the fresh air to circulate. There were also large porch areas, all open air, 24-7, 365 days of the year. Patients were often wheeled out in their beds to lay in the porch areas no matter the weather or season. Fortunately, blankets were not in short supply at Waverley, so patients could be wrapped in several layers of blankets, lying on newly invented electric blankets, to keep them warm whilst they lay in these open-air porches in the depths of winter. 
This often had the secondary effect of exposing the patients to the sunlight, another common form of treatment. Waverley was home to several solariums on the first, third and fourth floors, as well as sun lamps that could be clipped to a bed's headboard, exposing the patient to UV light for between 3 and 30 minutes. The sun lamps were most often used for treating patients with tuberculosis in their joints, skin, bones and eyes. On the more surgical end of the spectrum, Waverley had several methods of treatment they regularly performed, ranging from the minor, such as cupping, a common treatment still used on a fairly large scale today, to the more extreme last resort surgeries like pneumonectomies, a procedure which removed the patient's entire lung, and thoracoplasty, where patients' ribs were removed three at a time to remove the pressure from the chest cavity. Only around 5% of patients survived a thoracoplasty surgery, and it was only used in cases that were considered to be worth trying such last-ditch efforts, as they would leave the few survivors disfigured, and even a positive outcome did little but extend the patient's life for a short period, leaving many to find it not worthwhile. In between these extremes, there were numerous other surgeries performed at Waverley, such as a pleurectomy, whereby only the diseased sections of a patient's lungs were removed, and avulsions, a process that artificially paralyzes a patient's diaphragm, making breathing shallow and difficult, but deemed as a solid way to allow the lungs to recover with less stress and movement. All of these procedures took part in either the major or minor surgeries, of which Waverley had both. On the non-invasive end, treatments at Waverley could often simply test a patient's susceptibility to sheer boredom. Patients were made to lie in certain positions for hours upon hours, sometimes strapped to the bed or lying flat on their backs with weighted bags on their chests to stop the lungs from moving excessive amounts. With all stimuli removed so as to not encourage overexcitement, there was nothing for these patients to do but stare at the ceiling. With no outpatient programme, the average stay for a patient at Waverley was 444 days, and so there did have to be some things for them to do, or at least for those deemed far enough along in their recovery. And the sanatorium did provide a range of work and education programmes, from literature to basket weaving. Occupational therapy rooms ran workshops, making brooms, tablecloths, baby clothes and other small items, which were often sold to the public on open days. There were woodworking lessons, along with leather cutting, toy making, book binding and dressmaking workshops, all with an aim to teach the patient a skill they might be able to utilise in the real world once their stay at the sanatorium came to an end. For entertainment and leisure, there was a salon and barbershop on the first floor and an auditorium on the second, where guest speakers and entertainers came to give shows and lectures to the patients once per week. And so life continued, more or less, in this vein for several decades. Upon its opening, it was a state-of-the-art facility for a disease which was rampaging through the nation, dominant in Kentucky. But by the 1960s, once a cure for tuberculosis had been found, the hospital found itself facing obsolescence. It had already been the victim of cutbacks and mergers in the 1940s, and by the mid-1950s, 31 tuberculosis hospitals across America were shut down. The hospital, once full to capacity, now found itself having empty beds for the first time, with much of the good work done by the nurses and physicians that worked both at the sanatorium and on the hospital's numerous outreach programmes that had been working tirelessly to both treat and educate people in the downtown Louisville area, taking over from the earlier dispensary. By 1961, however, Waverley was seen as a huge drain on the community, and it was finally shut down in June the 1st of 1961, with the remainder of the patients transferred to Hazelwood Hospital and only a skeleton staff retained for maintenance and guard duties. Although the crew that remained was small, the hospital and its grounds were so large that the maintenance bill was still costing the state upwards of $70,000 per year, and efforts were made to sell the property to little effect. The great problem we have is that the thing is so cockeyed big we can't get rid of it, said Dr Stuart Graves Jr., the head of the Health and Welfare Council of Waverley Hills Committee. There was some interest though. After all, the hospital sat on a large swath of land that was valuable in its own right, 
but most deals fell through due to the renovation costs becoming far too prohibitive once the options were explored by prospective buyers. In 1962, the Negro Ward, one of the older buildings on the grounds, was bought by the state of Kentucky and leased to the Kentucky Geriatric Foundation for the creation of a hospice for the elderly. The hospital's name was changed to Woodhaven Medical Services, rooms were painted in bright pastels, and handrails were added with the total cost of renovations capping out at $312,000. It opened its doors to the public in October of 1962 with 200 patients, 25 doctors, a psychiatrist and 22 nurses. The rest of the land was later sold off, including 273 acres for the purpose of creating a state park, which opened in June 1966. Under the name Woodhaven, life at Waverley was not quite as state-of-the-art as it had been during its earlier days as a tuberculosis hospital. It took patients over the age of 62 upon its opening. However, later it would lower the age limit to 18, taking in mentally handicapped adults of all ages. It was a severe strain, however, to keep the old building in line with modern standards, and it suffered from overcrowding and stories of neglect by the staff towards patients. In August of 1980, an elderly patient named Claude Lefter, who was confined to a wheelchair, fell from a five feet drop from a hallway onto a loading dock below, dying in the accident. The state made a report which alarmingly highlighted 47 violations, including urine and faeces being found on the floors, walls and furniture of many of the halls and patients' rooms, roach infestation, overcrowding, lack of clean linen, cold food being served to patients, poorly kept records and medications and a general lack of care for patients who were often underweight, dirty and unattended to, sometimes for hours on end. Harsh penalties were drawn up and the owners were given an unfeasibly short amount of time to clean their act up. In September for the same year, it was closed down with the remaining patients transferred. Waverley's days as a functioning institution were over. In 1983, it was auctioned and the land split up for various commercial projects, including a retirement community and a prison, both of which fell through either due to financial difficulties or local protest. One of the more audacious plans was proposed by Robert Albahaski, who bought the property in 1996 in hope of building America's own version of the famous Christ the Redeemer that stands tall overlooking Rio. The plans called for a 270-foot statue, making it the tallest religious figure in the world. However, after a year of fundraising, the project had only mustered $3,000 and was scrapped. And so the building stood, falling slowly into disrepair, housing gangs, homeless and being looted of any shred of value until 2002, when Charlie Mattingly, a local whose father had worked in the sanatorium's kitchens from 1937, when he himself was just 17 years old, bought the property for $230,000 and later the adjoining 80 acres of land for $800,000. He had an eye to turn it into a non-profit healthcare centre and a haunted B&B, though somewhere down the line this plan became a hotel and convention centre. Either way, eye-watering estimates placed the cost between $20 and $45 million in renovations alone. Mattingly and his wife, however, thought the building too beautiful to let fall to decay. I'd heard a rumour it was for sale, and I inquired to a real estate agent who sent me a picture of the building with a wrecking ball next to it. I thought, they can't tear it down. I'd heard stories about it all my life. We're just trying to get it to a point where somebody can come in and say this could be something. We're trying to save a historic building, and we'll do it. Fortunately, for Charlie... He discovered that Waverley had become famous more recently for more than just its history as a tuberculosis hospital. When Mattingly first bought Waverley, his first port of call was just to stop further deterioration to the building due to the weather, along with cleaning up the mess that had been left by years of decay and trespassers. Mattingly soon found out a disconcerting trend among some of the trespassers, not simply at the sanatorium to find shelter, cause trouble or loot, Many were there to hunt ghosts. I wasn't aware of all the paranormal activity when I first got hold of the place. 
It just came on me. I discovered it myself. As I discovered it, I would run into other people who would tell me similar stories. As Charlie Mattingly was taking video footage of the building to send to contractors and to survey the work that would need doing, he noticed upon playback that there were patches of discoloration on the walls that didn't exist when he went back to check, as well as several shadows, orbs and various other lighting anomalies. He sent the footage off to a group whom he vaguely calls People, and the birth of the sanatorium as we know it today began. Thanks to his efforts in restoration, in certain new windows, doors, ceiling repairs and wall renovations, the building was made safe to visit and it has since been featured on numerous TV shows, made into films, radio plays and books, all focusing on the strange phenomena that Mattingly stumbled upon. Today, people have visited in the thousands in hopes of seeing the ghostly goings-on at Waverley for themselves. So what exactly is it that draws them in? When approaching the paranormal aspect of Waverley, the big question is, what came first? In a bizarre chicken and egg scenario, we're forced to ask, did the ghosts come to Waverley before Charlie Mattingly, or did Charlie Mattingly introduce the ghosts of Waverley? Some tales can be confirmed, whilst others can be roundly debunked, but many lay in the territory of local lore and legend. At least, that's how Mattingly would have it believed. The total number of deaths at Waverley would no doubt have been high. Tuberculosis was certainly cruel and viciously destructive, but the actual true count is unknown. Tina Mattingly has spread around a number in the 60 to 70,000 range via various ghost hunting TV shows, but in reality, that number is highly likely to be inflated, as the math just doesn't add up. Frank J. Stewart, the sanatorium's assistant medical director, recorded the highest number of deaths per year to have been 153 during his time working at the hospital. This is a far cry from the numbers needed to hit the Mattingly's figures, which would sit at around 2.7 deaths per day, or 985 deaths per year on average, and that's if we were to count the entire life of the hospital from 1910 until 1981. Regardless, the site would certainly have seen its fair share of death. So exactly what is it that people see at Waverley? One of the most persistent legends is of a nurse named Mary Hillenberg, who, upon finding herself pregnant and with zero prospects of marriage on the horizon, hung herself outside room 502 on the fifth floor of the main building. As time has gone by, the story has gotten slightly more gruesome, and by 2006, as told by Charlie Mattingly, she had now attempted to give herself an abortion, which was successful to a degree. She flushed the fetus down the toilet and then hung herself, which is why, when they found her body, she was apparently covered in blood. Staff then allegedly went down to the septic pond that flushed out the hospital's toilet water and pulled out the aborted fetus in order to give it a proper burial. Various other mediums and psychics have retold the same story, including their own twist, spicing it up with murder and torture. The story gives us a name though, so who was Mary Hillenberg really? This whole affair apparently took place in the 1930s, or perhaps, as told by some, in 1928. Maybe the stories confused those of another nurse who threw herself off the roof in 1932. Either way, both tales of suicidal nurses placed them on the fifth floor due to the vicinity of the nurse's station. The big problems with both stories are numerous, however. Firstly, the nurse's station was situated on the first floor rather than the fifth, and I could find no records of either deaths in any of the Kentucky papers for the periods between 1928 to 1939, and there are no death records for women with the surname Hillenberg before 1964, and of the two that did die between 1964 and 2000, neither were named Mary. Proponents of the story believe that it was kept a secret, covered up to protect the hospital, and most of the earliest accounts point to a local family named Thornberry who worked at the hospital spanning generations for the story's origins. One of the Thornberry family allegedly found the body and saw the nurse hanging for himself, and so the truth of it all lies only in verbal law passed down through generations. 
One of the rumours surrounding Waverley that does have a solid footing on the side of truth is the Death Tunnel. So named because staff used it to transport bodies from the hospital to awaiting hearses for them to be taken to funerals or collected by families. At 500 feet long and sloping downwards at a 30 degree angle, the tunnel remains open today. The Death Tunnel actually started life as a way to transport coal from the train tracks below up the hill to the hospital. As time went on, workers used it as a more efficient way to carry goods up to the hospital, and eventually, it actually did find its more macabre use, which has given it its moniker of death tunnel or body chute. In order to transport the bodies out of the hospital in a more discreet way, staff would lower bodies onto a gurney tied to a system of pulleys to the bottom of the hill for their transport away from the hospital. Most of the other ghosts of Waverley are impossible to verify or deny due to their circumstantial nature, but include shadow people often seen throughout the building. Every time I went in there to do work, it was just like someone was looking over my shoulder. I used to jump up because I thought a homeless person or a trespasser was walking through the building, but when I would go to run after the person or investigate that I thought I saw, they would just disappear. Existing throughout the hospital, at a range of sizes, the smallest of these shadows people resemble children and they stalk through the corridors, barely visible in the dark, but they have been noted to surround people silently as they walk the corridors. There is a man in white who appears to have a poor temperament and is most often seen hanging around the minor treatment room, leading most to speculate he was a surgeon or doctor. And then you have Timmy. Usually, we'll leave a ball laying around on the third floor, and as we go through, we'll note what room or where on the floor it's at, and then when we come back, we'll see if the ball has been moved. Just about like clockwork, the ball is always in a different place. We can't always confirm that someone didn't move it, or the wind didn't blow it, but it's kind of odd that every now and then the ball will move on its own. It doesn't happen all the time. Most of the time you'll just look at it, and look at it, and it won't do anything but the few times it does move, it's very unnerving. You'll say, okay Timmy, throw us the ball, or kick us the ball, and it doesn't move very much. It just sits there and it just sits there, and then this one time, it just might turn over once or twice. Timmy also has a friend named Mary, the spirit of a young girl who apparently enjoys playing hide and seek with tourists and ghost tours as they walk through the third floor halls. Mike Flickner, a guide at Waverley Hills, said he has been convinced for years of the place's haunted nature. I've locked doors before and watched them unlock themselves and open up. I've seen a tub of concrete slide by itself. Whilst it should be irrelevant, the building itself certainly looks the part of a classic haunted building, its dilapidated walls scratching out into the grey skies above, its corridors vast, winding and full of history, that most would rather not know. How much of the stories that surround it and add to its mystique are based in truth or exist purely in celluloid remains an unknown, but nevertheless, it retains its draw for those with curious minds. The history of Waverley is not quite the house of horrors it's made out to be today by cable TV shows looking to hype up a good atmosphere or to cover up for a poor end product. In reality, Waverley was a modern, high-tech facility that supported a community with up-to-date healthcare and selfless nurses and physicians. The truth to the later, more modern law behind the building is a different beast. Stories rarely start from nowhere. They grow in stature, find themselves hyped, blown up, and in the case of Waverley, at times overplayed and overreaching. But at their core, they all sprout from a seed planted by a simple tale. It seems fair to discount a lot of the stories as told by the television specials, but whether or not you believe the stripped back legends, the true horror can't be denied. That no matter the state of the institution, there is much to fear of being strapped to a hospital bed, staring at the ceiling with weights stacked on your chest, barely able to breathe, whilst waiting to die to a disease that held no prejudice, transferred invisibly through the air and infected at an alarming rate. 
When Charlie Mattingly found out the vast sums of money it would cost to renovate the hospital, he was quoted as saying, I knew the only way I could ever restore this old building was to make it famous. Stage one, complete. So that's pretty much the story of Waverly Hills. It's an interesting place. I watched a lot of bad, bad, bad ghost hunting TV shows for this episode. <laughs> but there, there are much worse ways to do research, so that was all right. We're back to talk a little bit about it after these short ad breaks. As mentioned at the start of the show, Dark Histories is an official affiliate with Audible, which is really great. I'm actually a member of Audible myself, so I'm really glad to bring in an advertiser that, you know, I actually do rate. For those that are not aware, Audible is an audiobook subscription service whereby you pay a monthly sub and you get a credit with each month to purchase an audiobook of your choice. When you cancel your subscription, you get to keep all your previously purchased books, which you can access across devices from Mac, Windows, Android and iOS, and they all stay synced up with one another. If this all sounds like something you might be interested in, hop over to audible.com forward slash dark histories and you can find a special offer. Sign up for a free month, including your first credit to purchase an audiobook of your choice. If at the end of the month you decide that it's not for you, you can cancel, not pay a penny, and you get to keep the audiobook from your trial, so it's literally a win-win. Thanks very much for suffering through my spiel and once again, if it does appeal, head over to audible.com forward slash dark histories, or you can find the link on the support page of darkhistories.com. Cheers. Ads are a pain in the butt, right? Of course, you can hit that 30 second skip button, and that's all cool. But a much cooler way of skipping the ads is to sign up to the Dark Histories patron. You get a bunch of different benefits for doing so, including ad free shows, access to early release episodes, full back catalogue of bonus episodes including the live stream archive and all the other bonus content you get access to all my research notes for each episode and you get the added bonus that you're actually a part of the show helping to keep it independent and sustainable from as little as one dollar a month so if you think that might be something you might be interested in doing hop over to darkhistories.com and you'll find the support page with all the details to get involved thanks very much for not skipping this and giving my hard sale a listen Let's get back to the show. Welcome back. Waverly Hills. Interesting place. It's like I say, I watched a lot of terrible ghost um, hunting series, which were oh, so bad. I mean, I literally, I, I don't think I can cite a single source for information that I actually received. In fact, in a way, it was sort of not really like research and much more like me just sacking off my real research to watch something ridiculous for a bit. So, it, you know, like I say, there were much worse ways to do research. But in a way, it was good to watch them because um, it reinforced what I wanted to do with this episode, which was talk about the ghosts a, a bit and, and sort of entertain the idea, but really focus on the history of the building because... You know, there, there, there are a lot of shows and podcasts, TV shows, YouTube videos, all sorts that cover, you know, the, the haunted stuff. And, and that's the fun stuff, really, I guess. But I thought, you know, is there really that many that have really kind of gone into a little more detail on the history, um, which is, to be honest, I find just as, in fact, if not more terrifying than the ghosts in a lot of ways. I mean, tuberculosis just sounded horrible as, as someone who suffers anxiety reading up about tuberculosis i don't recommend it it's it's absolutely savage i was like hyperventilating most of the time but uh it's it was a you know an interesting insight um looking at waverly because i didn't really know a lot about it say so, like a, most my knowledge comes from most haunted and i think is it the Booth Brothers? Is that what they're called? They've done kind of feature length documentaries on ghost hunting kind of things. They're quite early day stuff. That was pretty much all I'd seen up until this point. Um, but obviously I knew that it was kind of well covered um, listening to other podcasts. So I listened to a lot of ghost podcasts and things like that. But yeah, what surprised me, I think, most of all was discovering that Waverley was actually quite a positive place because 
you hear the word, you know, sanatorium, Waverly Hills, and you immediately think of the kind of the state it's in now, you know, the disrepair and the decrepit hallways. And you get sort of, you, you sort of mesh together, meld together all sorts of sanatoriums and asylums and sanitariums from the Victorian period. And they all kind of smash into one. But Waverley was a little later than that, you know, it was kind of early 1900s to mid 1900s. And it was really state of the art and like a really positive force in the community um, with everyone who worked there being utterly selfless and pretty much legends. That was my first kind of big surprise, I guess, was that it actually isn't a scary place when you look at the history. You could argue that when it became a geriatric centre, that didn't sound particularly great. But that's a tricky one because I was going through the papers and um, it seemed like it was fought on two fronts, really. Like the people that were running the geriatric centre believed that it was all kind of a conspiracy to shut them down because it was a drain on the state and the state just wanted it gone so they wouldn't give them enough time to get the building back up to a state that could be used and hit all the kind of modern compliances. And the people that were running it said they'd put together the money and they had like a plan to get it up to scratch, but the state still shut them down. So there's this kind of bickering going on and both have uh, an agenda, so it's difficult to know how much of that's true. Say. The people that were running it basically said that that report that explained a lot of the kind of poor conditions and mistreatment was actually kind of overblown. And to be honest, they've got a couple of things in their favour. Firstly, it's that when it did actually close down, a lot of the patients protested against this closure. So that makes you think, well, perhaps it wasn't that bad. And the state certainly wanted to close it down. So, you know, you do, it does make you wonder how bad it actually was. But those things aside, I think, you know, there was still a lot of deaths. Not clearly as much as Tina and Charlie Mattingly would have you believe, but there were obviously a lot of deaths. I found a lot of it was actually true. A lot of the stuff from the ghost hunting episodes and stuff was true, but they just overhype it to like an unnecessary amount. It's all sort of overblown and overhyped, basically. But a lot of it had like a foot in truth. But, for example, things like the death rate was totally overblown. Um, but there was still a lot of deaths there. So that that's the end of the day. That's kind of what annoys me about these shows and why I wanted to do my episode on Waverley's being more f- sort of based in fact, is that you don't need to say that there were 70,000 deaths there because there were obviously a lot. The physician who was running it said that for a number of years said that, you know, 153 deaths were the maximum. But that's a still a lot of deaths, you know, that's still one every other day pretty much or, you know, near or there or thereabouts. So that's still a lot of deaths, you know, you don't need to overhype this number. You can just give a real figure and say this is how many people died here. You know, you don't have to hype it in that way. I suppose, you know, the bigger the number makes it more haunted or something. I don't know. But still, I found, say, a lot of it was just overhyped, but had a foot in truth. So to talk about the kind of the truth of the ghosts and such, that was an interesting one. Clearly, this Mary Hillenberg was, it, it didn't exist. I personally can see no reason for the hospital trying to cover up her, her suicide. Back in 1928, Waverley was still on solid footing, really. It was still doing a lot of good work in the community. It hadn't kind of slipped to that stage where it was a drain. So there was, I don't, I don't think it would have marred Waverley as, as, as heavily as this story obviously wants to pretend it would have. And that's why it would have been covered up like a big conspiracy. So I don't really believe that. But, you know, you know, names can get confused and things can get lost. So I didn't find any reports of it in any newspaper, but perhaps it wasn't reported on just that simple. Waverley, to be honest, wasn't in the papers as much as you, or at least as much as I thought it would be. It was often in the papers, but often only in small stories. So, you know, it it could have gone by the wayside. And that said, I always find with ghost stuff, it's always strange that why why these places have to be kind of tragic, places where lots of people died anyway why can't they be like you know a ghost is just as likely to be in the modern 
setting than a decrepit old building. I suppose it's just the mystique and the kind of vibe. I think a lot of people are going to think that this episode is highly sceptical. And to a degree it is. But I always maintain that I, I do believe in the possibility of ghosts and stuff. And I, I obviously I love the idea that they might be real. But I suppose as a, a kind of lowercase s sceptic, all I ever want to do with dark history is when we talk about kind of the paranormal and such, is get rid of all the tosh and nonsense because that does nothing to aid in finding the truth, you know. And if the truth is slightly more boring than the reality, then so be it. But at least we've gotten rid of the tosh and now we can look at it realistically and see, you know, okay, these people saw ghosts and all the rest of it without having to overhype it and have some guy with an orange face who looks totally like a bro. I can't remember what, I think it was Ghost Hunters it was called. God, that guy who presents that. But yeah, you don't have to do that, you know. You don't have to give it all that. We'll basically lie and make things unfactual to make it more haunted, you know. Because as far as I'm concerned, you, you know, even if no one had ever died at Waverley, it could just be equally as haunted as if 70,000 people died at Waverley, you know. I'm a bit worried that people will think I'm being sceptical and down on Waverley and trashing their most beloved kind of Waverley, but I'm really not. Like, I'm with you guys. I, I, I believe it probably is, you know, haunted. I, I think you see a lot of the kind of most haunted and ghost hunters and stuff like that, and of course it's overhyped because it's made for, to be television and be entertaining. And I've been on ghost hunts before and they're entertaining to go on. But if I'd have videoed it, it would have been boring as hell to watch back, you know. So I understand that cable TVs have to hype these things to make them interesting because, frankly, they, like I say, they were really fun to go and do. But I'm sure if I'd have videotaped it, it would have been dull as dishwater because we just kind of sat around in the dark all night, which is hard to convey the atmosphere of places when... You know, what you've got is an atmosphere. You can't really record that on the video too much. So, or at least it's not obvious for a 20-minute program, you know. So I do get why they do it, but I, I wanted Dark Histories to be more about the facts, really. And to be honest, I find them just as terrifying. So, yeah, do I believe that it's haunted? Yeah, fully. I, 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 think, I think Charlie Mattingly has obviously overdone it a little, or not overdone it. I mean, he's done a perfect job, really. But I think he's obviously overhyped it. That the, the quote I thought was incredibly telling when he said, um, I knew the only way I could ever restore this old building was to make it famous. He's certainly done that. I mean, they've done the right number on it. As someone who listens to a lot of um, paranormal podcasts, he's certainly kind of nailed his PR for that. You know, he did the rounds just like as if he was selling a book. You know, you, you see when people release a book, they'll do the rounds on all the all the usual suspects. You know, he went and did all of that stuff in like the kind of early 2000s. A lot of them are still online and you can still listen to them. And, you know, he really kind of hyped up the idea of it being haunted and open to all. And, you know, only $100 a night per person. You can come and search. You know, he really played the heavy sell on it and um, sold it. Hev well, yeah, sold it heavily, basically. But I still, despite all of that stuff, I think, you know, I'm always open to the idea that ghosts might be there. I can't really comment much more on it than that, though, because obviously not going there myself. I've never experienced Waverly myself. I've seen a lot of ghost hunting shows, but they're really like poor barometers. Like I say, like, you can't judge it on that. So, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of left to say he, the, yeah, I'm I'm kind of not on the fence on it. I think if it probably is a haunted place, but I've got nothing to base that on other than the fact that I kind of want it to be, really. <laughs> um, because, like I say, I, I've not been there and, and the evidence that we have to judge it on is, is to say poor would be generous. I would love to go there, would really love to go there. There used to be a... An, a a sanatorium just up from where I lived and it's we used to go up there and do you know call it urbex or whatever like urban exploration and then um, take photos in there and it was amazing building like grand dance hall with 
like a stage and it was essentially like you know like a art deco theater it was gorgeous but it was all falling to pieces and then at the same time you would sort of walk into a room that was a salon that had been abandoned pretty much in, and it was almost like chernobyl with like pieces of salon equipment just sort of rotting in the middle of the floor that were you know it would have cost millions but they were closed down so quickly that they were more or less abandoned and it it, it, it was a beautiful building and and terrifying to go there as well so i'd love to go to waverley for sure 100 percent. and i and i as much as i hate all of the hard sell and the kind of promotion efforts and the kind of cheesy ghost ghost hunting programs and, and whatnot i get what charlie matley's trying to do and I, I i kind of support it in a way you know like it's good to save these old buildings that were often really beautiful and, and like he says a lot of his reason for wanting to save it was just that it, it did so much good to the community that he wants it to continue giving to the community although he has changed his tune there a little bit because he started off wanting it to be a kind of research health research center and now it's a convention and hotel I hope he still sticks with the idea of giving back to the community because one of the things with Waverley that again surprised me was how it was kind of communally built, you know, based on bonds and tax money and all the rest. And it kind of gave back to the community and it'd be nice to keep it going in this beautiful old building. So I kind of support him and I hope he does get it back. And I, I think, you know, I suppose if you've got to overhype things and oversell them to bad cable TV, TV shows, I mean, 45 million to renovate it. That's, that's a tough call. So, yeah, that's Waverley. And say so it was really heavily requested. So, I'm a little bit concerned that I've let you guys down on it a little bit because I think possibly a lot of people were hoping that I could talk about the creepy ghosts a lot and things like that. But really, I'll, that's already out there. You know, I wanted to do something a little different. So I hope you still found enjoyment in it and found enjoyment in kind of the, the history of the place rather than the ghost, because it, it all goes hand in hand, really, you know. But yeah, that was that. Thanks very much for listening. Um, this weekend, obviously no live stream because it was the episode. Next weekend, we will be having a live stream. We'll probably be talking about Waverly, but I would like to talk more about other like, ghosts and stuff. Um, probably on the live stream we'll talk a little bit about the history but mostly we're talking about like the kind of the actual haunting stuff on the live stream and and kind of possibly you know bringing some other sanatoriums um obviously all are welcome to come on the live streams are free for all for everyone um so yeah if you fancy coming on go for it i'll post stuff on that on our social media when it gets there uh social media we're on facebook instagram twitter if you want to have a look at all of that stuff, check out darkhistories.com. All the information's there. Follow any of the social media from there. And also find all of the links for the ways that you can support the show. And all of that would be incredibly helpful. So, yeah, thanks very much. If you enjoyed it, rate, review, share with your friends, all the rest of that good stuff. I will see you tomorrow, I guess, for yesterday today. That just leads me to say thank you very much for listening as always. It's been an absolute pleasure and I will see you soon. Sleep tight.